I've been getting too smug recently. I've been showing off way too many nice pieces on YouTube that I've succeeded in breeding. So today I'm going to make a humble video and talk about my top 10 failures. That's right, because behind the scenes I too fail at breeding things sometimes. Now I don't like to flaunt this fact on YouTube because it's painful. Sometimes I get really excited or hyped up because I'm about to receive eggs of a very rare species and then when I receive them they fail. That really sucks and I like to bury that, that fact emotionally as, fact, as fast as possible. But today I'm going to tell you about some of my epic failures. That's right. I'm going to start with the worst one from the, uh, number one and I'm going to backtrack to number ten. That's the other way around because usually you should start at uh, the one that's that bothers you the least and uh, go from 10 to number one that's considered the worst but I'm gonna start with the worst number one my worst failure eudaimonia let's show you a picture that's a pretty insect right I agree it's one of my favorite silk moths in the world and in fact its larval stages are very poorly known and even unknown to science in most cases. Now, I am one of the few very privileged people that has managed to receive eggs of this moth. Can you imagine how excited I was? But when I received the eggs and they hatched, the caterpillars died after five hours. That's really short. Usually they last for about a day, even if they don't feed, but these just hatched and died. To make it even worse, the eggs were like 10 euro each. Am I discouraged? No, next time I'm gonna try them again. The fact remains that not a lot is known about their biology at all, despite they are, uh, the fact that they are really common in some parts of Africa. They're really one of the most common silk moths in some seasons where uh, males can be found flying almost everywhere. Despite that, their larval stages are poorly known. I do know for a fact that they feed on Albizia and some kinds of Acacia, although that's not really confirmed at least Fabaceae trees and um, that family. So that's really one big failure. Remember the video I made showing you them? And the caterpillars died in less than 24 hours after rejecting the food plant that I gave them. I don't know if it's possible to see them. Here are some, there are some tiny dead larvae in here. Carcasses. And basically I thought they would eat Acacia even though their natural host plants are Dalium and Albizia. I don't have Albizia in winter and Acacia can be strongly related to Albizia. Either way, point is they died, which is disappointing but not that surprising because it's a, a moth of which next to nothing is known about the ecology and life cycle. So <clears throat> exactly it was that video. Well, let's go to number two. What's my second worst failure that bothers me the most? I think it's my Archaeosamia Watsoni, guys. Archaeosamia, look at this picture. Now this is a really interesting moth because it both has traits of an atlas moth from the genus Attacus and a tree of heaven moth from the genus Samia. It's called Archaeosamia, so it's not really a Samia uh, because uh, Archaeo means actually it means primitive. And if you think about it, uh, it is a really an, a primitive species and which has a unique evolution. And I think it's a very ancient relative of the modern Samia species, which makes this insect really fascinating for somebody that likes silk moths like that. Also interesting is there are no pictures of the caterpillars found anywhere online. So I had, was lucky enough to receive eggs of them, and I even managed to read them to the second instar before they died. But the fact that they died really remains painful to this day because if I would have managed to raise them to the cocoon phase or adults I would have been the first to describe their life cycle but it wasn't meant to be. Now even their host plant is the wildest completely unknown. 
although in some cases they have been reared on liquid amber but with a lot of losses that means many of them die now why is it because liquid amber is probably not what they eat in the wild and it's it's not a good choice for them but they are still willing to feed on it so <coughs> that's it let's see number three and number four are related they are Anterea Montezuma and Anterea Godmani let's show you some pictures They remind us of the North American Anthorea polyphemus, the polyphemus moth. That's because they are closely related Anthorea moths from the North American continent. Anthorea godmani and Montezuma, well, they come from Central and South America. And they can be found in the Amazon rainforest, but also Mexico, Costa Rica and other places. Now these moths, here we have another one. The Anthorea godmani. Um, it's a relative of the Anterea polyphemus, for those who know the North American Saturnids. It uh, looks almost identical to Anterea polyphemus, except uh, for the shape. Uh, it has, a, especially the males, have a very strange ring shape. Here, have some more. So. They are reasonably rare, although their biology is known to science, so it's not, not that rare. This, they are still quite well known, their caterpillar stages are known. And in fact there are a few people in Europe that have bred them. And I wanted to be one of them because they are just so fascinating to see in their, their interesting wing shapes. And um, I have also bred the Anteria polyphemus from North America, it's a very easy species to breed. And for that reason alone, I would love to see their crazy cousins from South America. The main problem why they are so difficult is because they are very picky on what kind of oak tree they feed on. They need very clean leaves. They don't tolerate any kind of lice on them or, you know, that kind of sooty stuff or bacteria or fungi. And, you know, in summer in Europe, some oak is of really crappy quality. It has infections and diseases and parasites and whatever. So you have to find the cleanest and cleanest of good quality leaves. And I also think they really prefer the thick uh, leaves of oak. Now another reason I failed in raising them is not only because the caterpillars are sensitive, but I usually receive the eggs very late, in about September. And that's right before autumn starts to set in and the oak trees are dropping their leaves. So that means I will be left of no host plant yet to feed them because in autumn the leaves just drop from the trees and yeah then they basically starve because they have nothing to feed them and their timing really needs to be right let's move on to the next species yeah i'm i'm i have a list here if you're while i'm looking away i can't remember this all from the top of my head uh let's go to number five actios night Huferi. actios night Huferi is also known as the taiwanese silk moth It's um, actually the Taiwanese moon moth, not the Taiwanese silk moth. Ugh. The Taiwanese moon moth, sorry guys. English not my native language. Sometimes I kinda, I screw up, that's right. Actius Nightuferi is endemic to Taiwan only, and it's very rare, it's very rare. Uh, I think it's actually related to Actius Dubernardi and Chapai and all the other pine feedings uh, moon moths from that family. Now, what's interesting is they don't feed, uh, they seem to feed on Tsuga, not on Penis or Larix. Excuse me for using the scientific names here, but I don't know the English name for all these trees. I, need, I, mean, I know that Penis is, um, what was Penis again? Oh, I forgot the name. It's, it's a coniferous tree, uh, the same that Actias du Bernardi feeds uh, on, and uh, Gaelsia Isabella. Ah, no, it's Pine Tree, of course, it's Pine Tree. Now, most moon moths, they feed on pine tree, but Actias netuferi prefers to feed on tsuga. I think that may be fir tree, but I'm not entirely sure. I think it's fir, and they like to eat fir instead of pine. And it makes rearing them very difficult, because they also prefer very particular species. The caterpillars are very sensitive. Uh, they need the right humidity. It's a species that comes from a mountainous region. So they need 
they don't need to be too hot or too cold and they're just uh, really really difficult to breed and I was one of the few people who managed to receive eggs of the Actios nitoferi um, yeah but the caterpillars died so it's a shame but I will try again really I will try again until I succeed and hopefully show all of you guys a living specimen now the next one is also painful it is Automerus Janus Well, it's not a rare species at all, really. In some countries, Automerus Janus, it's a very common moth. But one problem is, uh, I'm a really huge fan of Automerus, especially the big species. And these South American species, even if they're common in South America, they're very difficult to get in captivity. Because, well, there are issues with shipping and legality. I mean, uh, there's not many people get a permit for collecting South American insects. And uh, yeah, generally it's very hard to get them as livestock. Either way, I had gotten eggs of Automerus Janus. I'm a big fan of this species, and it's one of the biggest Automerus species in the world with a huge wingspan. I believe it's 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 over f to 14 or 15 centimeters, so that's really incredible. But I couldn't get them to eat, and why is beyond me. I gave them the correct host plants, the correct conditions. In my mind, I did everything right. But maybe you remember my sad video where I was complaining that my Altimeris Janus died. Because I was very excited to rear um, the biggest species of Altimeris on earth. I think one of the biggest called Altimeris Janus, but look at this. All the larvae died. They shriveled up and died. They stopped feeding. So it means that I lost two species today that were very special to me. And it really sucks. Right, well, I was really pissed, guys. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of a failure. Unfortunately, it's kind of painful to think about. Now, let's move on to the next one. Another painful failure is Orthogonioptilum. What a scientific name. Let me show you the moth. That's not really an exciting looking species, but for me, it is exciting. Because Actually, nothing is known about Orthogonioptilum at all. I believe in Africa there are like 40 species of them, which is crazy. Because some of them look identical and you can only see the difference uh, when you dissect them and look at their genitalia. But for some reason this is a genus with a few almost identical looking species. That's really specious, really uh, a diverse genus that has many species in it. This was more exciting. The host plants and biology are completely unknown. I've only seen one picture of a caterpillar so far in my entire life. So breeding any species of Orthogonioptilum would have been pretty good. Orthogonioptilum. It's a silk moth from the family Saturnidae. My favorite family. And I just had eggs hatch of this species. I wanted to breed them, but what were I going to give them for food? Here are some plants that I've tried, including Ligustrum, Bramble, Clover, Eucalyptus, but there are no signs of feeding yet. Great! And a breakthrough for uh, the biology of silk moth, really. I would have written a scientific paper about that, but I couldn't find anything they were willing to eat. So yeah, in that case, it's just a complete gamble to try and breed such pieces. It's a shame, but I'm going to try again when I'm able to receive more eggs. Number 8. Pseudautomeris lata. Let's show you some pictures. This is a species from South America. Um, I got them from French Guiana. A friend of mine traveled there and he was kind enough to bring me back eggs. Is it a rare species? No. Is it obscure species? No. Is their biology unknown? No. So why am I upset? Well, because I'm a very big fan of Autemiris and their relatives. And to me they're caterpillars and adults, they're just incredible looking. Their markings, their colors, everything about them fascinates me. 
Which is why it was really frustrating that I was unable to raise them. Uh, I even got them feeding quite well on Ligustrum, uh, Privet, but for some reason they just wouldn't grow well and I lost them. I can still to this day not find any reason for something that I did wrong. Perhaps it was their host plant, but I don't think so, because I know other people that have raised these pieces on Ligustrum in Europe. So. Maybe something was wrong with the eggs. I don't know, I don't really like to blame the, the livestock instead of myself, but I think in this case, yes, problem was with the livestock. Next one, Apifora species. Oh guys, this is... Guys, this is... On my YouTube channel, you've seen me show off these beautiful Apifora silk moths. Let me show you some of them I had in the, this year and previous year. Hello everybody and welcome to my video. Today I'm here to show you this wonderful moth that just hatched from its cocoon. After almost half a year of waiting. It's a moth from Kenya. And I believe it's Apifora plutzi, or at least a species that is strongly related to Apifora plutzi. As you can see, it's a rather big moth. Hello everybody and welcome to my video. You're all just in time because a spectacular moth just emerged from my Ugandese uh, cocoons. And it's an Apifora species, obviously, but exactly what species um, remains a little bit of a mystery. I've been through the Apifora species of uh, Uganda, and I think the closest match is uh, Apifora um, Margini Maculata, I believe is the scientific name. I don't know if I pronounced that right, I didn't learn it from the top of my head, I just had a quick look on Google. Either way, it's a spectacular moth and it's, it's probably the first live footage of this insect. Those are really interesting species. They are Apifora uh, plutzi, Apifora uh, intermedia. I've even had some that were DNA tested in order to find out the species. And they were very obscure species from Africa. And for some reason, uh, I have a few suppliers from Africa they are able to collect eggs and cocoons of the most beautiful AP4 species that you can imagine. Which is not something to complain about, of course, because I'm very happy with them. But for some reason my breeding experiments always fail, and mainly due to one reason. It seems that my AP4 moths always emerge in autumn. Maybe you remember my video where I even paired a male and a female together. This is quite a joy to see. It looks like I have a natural pairing of a mystery, a mystery species of Epiphora moth from Uganda. This species is no, has not been ID'd, I've been working on it, but they are very complicated. They look uh, similar to Epiphora plutzi or Epiphora intermedia, but honestly I'm just not sure whatever they are. In fact, I thought the male and female were a different species. Although, I've been convinced they were the same species since yesterday and this pairing pretty much confirms it. Well, actually not, because sometimes hybrids can form when different species pair, but yeah, I still think they're the same. Too bad I can't show their amazing colors right now, because they're pairing, I don't want to disturb them. So, let's leave them here. To do their own thing. If you want to see the developments, check my YouTube channel, please. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the caterpillars from that were actually very easy to raise on Willow, and I raised them to the third instar on Willow. But there's one main problem with Epiphora, and that's the fact that their caterpillars grow very slow. Like I think about one and a half to two months, maybe maybe longer than two months before they're adults. Uh, some of these Apifora species are very big, so it takes a lot of time to rear them to adults. 
And every time I had eggs of them, I mean, I, I paired them many times, but every time it happens in late summer or autumn, which is not enough time to raise them before it starts to freeze outside and all my trees start to lose their leaves. Basically, the caterpillars starve because I have nothing to feed them every time and it's a very frustrating problem. And to solve this problem, I would need to obtain some eggs in spring or obtain a pairing in spring. Uh, if you lived in Africa, it would be no problem or in a place that doesn't have winters like this, but maybe if you can grow their host plant indoors, I've been considering that they eat ceanothus. I think uh, you can grow that inside, but I still like to raise them the way I raise all my other species without any interference. Now for number 10, number 10 is a species that we all know it's actually uh, a rather common one from North America. It's Hyalophora kegropia. I should say Hyalophora cacropia. It's the robin moth, and some of you may be surprised because that's a really common species that's really commonly available in the hobby. And yeah, it's true. Uh, I agree, they're really beautiful. I would like to breed them. I've tried over four times to breed this species. I had so many pairings, I had so many eggs, but for some reason I just really failed to raise them to the cocoon stage. I don't get what I'm doing wrong. I do know that the caterpillars, they need a lot of ventilation, like if you put them in plastic boxes, they'll literally die. You cannot raise these in plastic boxes, they need to be very, very well ventilated. This is a well-known fact. Despite having access to all this knowledge, I still cannot raise them for the life of me. It's really my, my nemesis species, the robin moth. And this year I, I just I just ordered 50 eggs of them, so I'm gonna go try again this year and I'll probably fail. I hope not, I'm gonna do my best, really. Uh, I'm gonna try and sleeve them on my apple tree. But yeah, the robin moth is really one of one of those species I just I just cannot seem to get right, whatever I try. So if, you, if you've bred them, then comment some tips for me. Because actually there are a lot of breeders that have bred these species and maybe they know th something that I don't. Uh, well, thanks for watching. And I just want to say all the species I've mentioned in this video, I have the sources to get eggs from all of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and try again and again every year until I succeed and until I can show some to my viewers. All right, let's wait until the noise is gone because I also love to share them, my success with all of you. Now, and don't forget, uh, this much of this hobby is trial and error. Uh, failure is nothing uh, you should be ashamed about. Even the best breeders in the world, they fail to breed things sometimes. In some cases we don't know anything about the biology of these insects and it's, it's just a pure gamble to try and find out what they really need in captivity. But keep trying guys and you'll succeed. Thanks for watching and this is my top 10 failures.